Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, in this painting, he's right there, to accept the Confederate surrender, the formal surrender. You remember Chamberlain? It was his 20th Maine that held Little Round Top and saved the day at Gettysburg. He was by then a major general. He had been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest award for bravery. He was horrifically wounded at, at the Petersburg lines and left for dead, but somehow survived. In fact, that ancient wound would kill him in 1913. He would become what? Just watch <laughs> He's in a hurry. The bell had rang. Oh no! So, and yeah, Chamberlain would become a three term governor of Maine. He would teach every course at Bowdoin College except for math. Pretty amazing guy. And lived all the way to 1913. The guy who had surrendered to the formal surrender for the Confederacy, John Gordon, a general, had been shot and wounded five times, three times in the face. And somehow he survived and lived to, I believe, 1909. They were of a different breed back then. They were tough, my generation. And with that, the thing is, now what? There's still some Confederates. Davis is running south, but the war is basically over. What's going to come after this? Just a month before, Lincoln had his second inaugural address, and there is a picture of him. Lincoln had his second inaugural, and you don't need to write this. I just saw how he ended the speech. But he taught healing and reconciliation. But he implied there's going to be reconstruction. The South is going to have to be changed. Yeah, one rip. But we don't know. The war was still going on when he gave the second inaugural. And Lincoln didn't want to say, we'll hang every traitor, because that might get him to fight even harder, because why quit? But the problem is he implied we have to come back together, but at the same time, it's going to be a new country. It's going to be different. And so there's now this big gray area. So Lincoln gave his inaugural. That's the last picture ever taken of Lincoln. That's a really good picture, I think. Whenever they look at the camera, you know, they're always like this, because they're trying to keep their eyes open. He's doing the same thing there, but looks a little bit more, at least candid, you know, not quite, it's, it's not quite this pose. And boy, does he, you know, looks old, but also in a way relieved. Because at that inauguration, right about there, was John Wilkes Booth. Booth was going to assassinate him at the inauguration, but he lost his nerve. But then after Lee surrendered, as partially for revenge, five days afterwards, he would lead a conspiracy to kill President Lincoln. John Wilkes Booth was a famous actor, so he could go in and out of theaters, like, for example, Ford's Theater. And when he heard Lincoln was going to see a play at Ford's Theater, the conspiracy with these friends, most of them were just kind of there's a motley crew of people that he associated with in Washington, D.C. at Mary Surratt's boarding house. But Ford's Theater, has anyone ever been there? It's tiny. I expect that, you know, you think Ford's Theater. I don't know why you think it's such a big deal, such a big event happened there. It's like it'd be this big mass and it's a little tiny theater. And he went to watch a play called My American Cousin, a comedy that he loved. He was having a great time. And if we watch it today, none of us would laugh. But then it was funny. You know, humor changes. And Grant was supposed to go with them, but Grant begged out. He didn't want to go, so he had his wife act like she was sick, so Grant didn't have to go. Because Booth was going to kill him, too. Booth could move around and get to the theater because he's an actor, so they didn't stop him. And so he could get into the balcony seats where Lincoln was, and he pulled out a derringer, which is a small pistol, and from a few feet away shot Lincoln. The thing was, is that black powder doesn't put with the bullet very fast. So it went about this far into his skull right here. So it went into the skull. And then Booth jumped out. But they put this in here, to, so they showed this kind of bunting with a flag around where he's sitting. His foot caught on this. And he was really acrobatic. He could do all these stunts and tricks on stage. So he was gonna do this dramatic jump 50 feet down to the stage. But he stumbled because of this and shattered his ankle. 
compound fracture. The bone was sticking out. I mean, it was a horrible one. He got up and said, well, everyone supposedly said, but no one's really sure, sick temper tyrannus, which is Latin for death to tyrants, and then stumbled off. A surgeon came up, off an off, army officer who had been with the Army of the Potomac, and he didn't have his kit with him. Which they would have a brass probe where they would stick into the hole to find where the bullet is. And But if you can't do that, it, the procedure was on the battlefield, you find where the bullet is. So we used the next best thing and stuck it in there. The problem is when he pulled it out, he opened up all the blood vessels. He might have lived. There's a shot he could have lived. But once that happened, no chance. Just bled out. Now, the thing was, the doctor did nothing wrong for the time, but looking back, it was a mistake. One of those kind of things. And they drug Lincoln over to Willard House. But that wasn't the only other assassination. Lewis Powell was going to go kill the Secretary of State, or William Seward. But Powell knifed and stabbed him a couple times, cut him up pretty bad, slashed him right here on the edge of his right under the chin. Look how close that is. I would have killed him. Yes, miss killing. Azeroth was going to kill Vice President Johnson. There's his picture right before he's executed. But Azeroth lost his nerve and went to a tavern and got drunk. So they drug Lincoln's body over to a boarding house called Willard House, which is part of the American, uh, the National Park Service today. If you go to Ford's Theater, you just cross the street and there's where Lincoln died. And it is preserved as close as they could get to where it was that morning in 1865 when Lincoln died. It's really well done. In fact, the bed, which was too small for Lincoln, he couldn't fit in it. The bed, he had to be laid sideways, and they have not changed the sheets since. And so if you go there, they still have on the, you know, the sheets and the pillow, it is black from the blood. And, okay, when I first thought that I had blue, you know, that's, I don't know if I just really want to see his blood. But when you actually see it that way, it, it really does work. It's really pretty remarkable. And so get a chance to go there. Lincoln passed away. Yeah. Um, so like two slides back, you showed the picture of him getting shot. Yeah. Or, like, no, that's his wife. Right, and then who are the and then a uh, guy named George Rathborn, Major Rathborn, okay. took Grant's place. He and his wife went, and Rathborn tried to stop him, and Booth shot, but he had a, da had a dagger in his hand, a knife, and slashed Rathborn and jumped. That's part of the reason his book caught because he was trying to get away from Rathborn, and his leg caught. This is it's really cool if you get a chance. The only thing about going to Washington, D.C. is that I know there are so many things to see, but this is really something to see. And <laughs> it's something. No, it's really cool. And a huge manhunt for him. And a Dr. Mudd would set his leg, and he would be arrested for being part of the conspiracy, even though he probably wasn't. They just want to revenge. Him. We just want to get out. Anybody responsible. He'd eventually be captured, ten, well, cornered 10 days later in Maryland or in Virginia. Surrounded and in the fight to try to finally storm the barn where Booth was hiding, Booth would be killed by a cavalry, by a trooper. So Booth died right there. And they could have maybe saved him, but you know, everybody just wanted to get their hands on him and kill him. And Lincoln, who was not terribly popular, well, would become a martyr. You know, that's you saw the same thing with him when like President Kennedy was assassinated. He was not terribly popular. At that time, last year's popularity was really low. But then, the shock of this, people remember him differently. And here's the execution of four of the conspirators, including, you see her right there? Mary Surratt, who owned the boarding house, was executed. They had no proof at all that she was involved in the conspiracy. Her son was, but no proof she was. But they wanted revenge so badly, they condemned her too. So that's literally seconds after the trap door went in their next book. There's other pictures of them putting the, the noose around the back. So the new president's President Johnson. <coughs> he had come from about as humble means as any president in American history. I mean, he had nothing. And worked his way from being a tailor to becoming 
What does a tailor do? He had made himself to be a senator, and he always hated the wealthy, rich aristocrats, the planters that started the war. That's why he stayed loyal to the Union. He saw himself as a Jacksonian Democrat. But about the former slaves, well, that's something else. And his presidency started off bad immediately when he got drunk right before he sw uh, was sworn in. Relax, have a drink of whiskey, somebody told him, and he drank a bottle of whiskey. Oh, yes. That's a bad omen. But the war's not quite over. Johnston, the last little bit of Union forces in the East would surrender a couple of weeks after Lincoln was assassinated, actually, in North Carolina, Johnson was put back into command. He surrendered to General Sherman, who they were friends. Johnson, Johnson would die of his old wound, the 1862 wound. He died in 1889, finally. But he just begging for a while there. Sherman was one of his pallbearers. I always find that interesting. It was a wet, sleet, um, sleety March day, really cold. And Sherman, well, out of respect for his friend, did not wear a hat <coughs> as one of the pallbearers. And they asked him, it's miserable, and you're in your 70s. You shouldn't wear, you know, why did you wear a hat? He said he would do the same thing. He had a cold, turned pneumonia, died two weeks after. In 1889, what did they do for somebody with pneumonia? Here's a blanket. Hope for the best. Hope you recover. Boy, antibiotics change things. Does pneumonia when you cough blood? He can, yeah. It's, it's a massive infection in your lungs. And you basically fill up, your lungs fill up, and you can't breathe anymore. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, did people like try to make antidotes for it? And, like, oh, sure, all kinds of things. Yeah. So, Davis was captured a couple weeks later in Georgia trying to escape. They put a cape on him. And so, you, uh, Northern cartoonists would claim that he dressed as a woman. That kind of wacky sexist humor was really popular back then. I think it kind of still is. And, president in petticoats they put down. And they said the same thing about Lincoln back in 1861. The last battle of the Civil War would happen at the end of May in Texas, a little cavalry battle. The Confederates won, ironic, isn't it? Just a little battle. Well, now the war is over and no one's really not sure what to do. But Andersonville prison was a prison in Georgia. The Confederates kept POWs there after 1864. Grant would not allow the exchange of POWs anymore, and so both sides had to keep prisoners, and both sides did, had horrific treatment for prisoners of war. Didn't feed them enough, tortured them, they died, north and south. But the South lost. So the commandant of this hellhole, Andersonville prison, would be charged for a war crime. They basically just fenced off an area, threw some food in, and said, live or die. We don't care. His name was Henry Wirtz. He was a Swiss immigrant, and he had been horrifically wounded a couple years earlier. He could barely function. He was hooked on laudanum, which is morphine. There were a lot of morphine addicts after the Civil War. People think opioid addiction is a new thing. No. It's the worst now than it's ever been, but it was really bad after the Civil War. And Wirtz would be tried for a war crime and executed. He'd be the only Confederate executed despite all the Confederates who committed treason. Jefferson Davis was held in prison for two years, and then they just let him go. Lee was never in prison. Davis was actually hated in the South, but then years afterwards would become a hero. Years afterwards. And whoever wins, they can, they can decide who the war criminal is. Well, this puts down the number of deaths total in the war that was the accepted figure up to about 20 years ago, about 618,000. And I put this up here to give you an idea how out of about 32 or 3.2 million, that's huge. So World War II, a lot died, but it's also a lower percentage of the 16 million men and women who were uniform. This number in Afghanistan and Iraq now is well over 7,000. This was a few years ago, this chart. But this is not accepted. And the thing about it is, we think it's a lot more, and I put down, how can you unify a country? How can you forgive each other when you have almost one million 
at least 850,000 now is what they're saying, troops died, and a million total Americans. These numbers right here were the old accepted figures, and now we believe they are very low. If it's as many as 850,000 troops and a million people, that means one out of 10 men died. All men, all males, one out of 10 died. That means if you put it in today's numbers, we're talking about 30 million people died. In just, in just uh, the United States. Remember, Montana is a million people. How do you come together? So the shadow of the Civil War would, yes, it goes on to this day, but that's why in the North, especially right after the war, they would put monuments in every town remembering the war. You see the same thing in World War I in Europe and the US. You know, there's statues all over. Just remember, yes, we put up, we don't want to forget. Southern statues will come uh, when they're trying to reestablish white supremacy. Yeah. How long did it take to get like the gender balance back? Like to where is that supposed to like 50? Well, it's gonna take um, it was already kind of 50-50 because there were more men and women. Back then. So many women died in childbirth. So the, the that gender wasn't quite, it just slightly more women. So it did not take long. Not like it would today, if that kind of thing happened one out of ten men died. And the other thing is in the South, groups like the sons and sons of the Confederacy and the daughters of the Confederacy would have great power, these veterans groups, years after the war. In the North, there's the Grand Army of the Republic, the GR, G A R. The daughters of the Confederacy would become so important to try to keep this kind of mythology of the South going that they would put monuments everywhere into the 20th century, including Helena. A Confederate monument would be here. Helena City Council took it down last year. And well, I'll tell you where all those came, but out of this you have reconstruction. And reconstruction is not like just, it's not the rebuilding like, hey, there's, there's a blown up building, let's rebuild it. What Reconstruction was is a twofold thing. First off, everything's now different in the South. So, click. There's the economic and political reintegration into the South, or it's back into the country. You got rid of slavery. I mean, that whole system was there. Political and economic is now blown apart. And they really tried in Reconstruction. Northern, what they call them, radical Republicans, try to bring equal rights to at least all men. Be clear about this. They really tried. They tried to bring equal rights, political, economic, and social rights. They succeeded in something, but for the most part, fell apart. And people forget about that. Southerners would try to emphasize that it was almost like a punishment of the South. No, they really tried to bring equal rights. And the other problem was they didn't know how to do it. Who will do it? Will it be Congress? Will it be the president? That's going to be an issue that will plague Reconstruction and part of the reason why the North is going to grow tired of it. And when the Republican Party, when the war ended, wanted to bring equal rights, by the end of the 1870s, the Republican Party had bigger priorities. Money. And so with that, Lincoln, during the war, had already started at Reconstruction, but his 10% plan, the 10% plan was a wartime plan. It was meant to be very lenient, to convince the South that you can quit the fight, we won't punish you, but also to kind of try to convince Northerners for winning the war. And it's a twofold thing. First off, if all adults, males, can give an oath, an oath to the United States, and this sketch shows it, giving the oath. And if they get an oath, they give the oath, they get amnesty. You know what amnesty is? Just a, a parallel line. Yeah, they will not be convicted, or they will not be arrested for the crimes they commit, AKA treason. Now, that's pretty lenient. They did try to keep out some Confederate leaders and uh, the wealthy. But once 10% pledge in a state, it's back in people. And they're what they call a, they, they, they literally call it a reconstructed state. I put on state reconstructed. 
The whole reason Lincoln did this is to make it look like we're winning and convince the South it won't be that bad. So in 1864, there's going to be, they literally called them Lincoln governments, where they could say there was a reconstructed Tennessee, Louisiana, and Arkansas. And that's where Andrew Johnson, as vice president, was, the governor of Tennessee. Now, everybody knew this was a wartime measure, at least anybody thinking rationally. And they knew after the war there'll be a different plan. I mean, this was a political, in a way, almost a stunt. We're winning, don't worry about it. The problem was Lincoln died before we knew his true intentions. All we knew was it's going to be more than this. But what does that even mean? Congress, Republicans in Congress in 1864 were actually mad at Lincoln. You're too lenient on these traitors. And they would pass the Wade Davis bill, which was much stricter reconstruction. Harsher, 50% loyalty over a lot of things. Prison time for leaders. But Lincoln pocket vetoed it. I just put this up here so if I wanted to point them out, I could remember who. But it's even important when I was Navy. But Lincoln didn't sign the bill. They called that a pocket veto bill. That can't really happen today. It's more complex. But and Lincoln was actually really mad at the Republicans. You guys don't get it. We can't have a strict Reconstruction until we win the war. Because a strict Reconstruction will convince the South to fight harder and not surrender. The U.S. will have the same issue, the U.S., the British, and the Soviets will have the same issue in World War II. And then right before the second inauguration and at the Appomattox Courthouse, the 13th Amendment got through Congress and was sent to the states. See, it was ratified then in December of 65. It was right before the surrender. So it was right before the surrender, Congress, two thirds of Congress, yeah, two thirds has to vote for it. And then it goes to the states, and three quarters of the states have to approve it. So Congress approved it right before surrender, and then in December they ratified it. So, like, this includes southern states that voted on this or? It's really complex. Okay. We'll have to get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. So, what happened was it ended slavery. No, it didn't. Did nothing about citizenship or rights. And there is a loophole, except as punishment for crime. So, if you're punished for crime, your sentence can be that you'll be a slave. And that is still constitutional. Gee, I wonder how long it took people to realize that loophole. So by 1900, you're going to have cities, especially in the South, the police departments will literally have quotas to go pick up men to imprison them so they need work done. They literally have quotas. We need to pick up a thousand men to go arrest them. Almost all black, of course. So that's a big loophole. But an important law. And so if you're arrested for something, yes, you can be enslaved. Isn't that comforting? No. Don't be arrested. So that. That doesn't just sound like I'm just trying to say get away with it. Don't. So, another thing that would be done for slaves, called freedmen. Free slaves were called freedmen. Male or female, they just called them freedmen. It was called the Freedmen's Bill. It was 1865. They'd actually passed another improvement of it in 1866. And the big thing was, what about the slaves? They're going to need help to assimilate in society, like education. Maybe a little bit of food, but it was just... It wasn't like we're going to feed you, just a little bit. Some help, some protection. And this is a picture glorifying the Freedmen's Bureau of a Union soldier, but complying with the Freedmen's Bureau, defending former slaves. And a lot of Northerners, very ideal, idealistic ones, went south to educate, to teach, and <clears throat> provide a little bit of help. It's obviously very limited. But that's a pretty, I, there's a paint, a watercolor of it, but I really like that picture of the students. But the thing is, and I got to stop it right there, that's it. The tiny bit of help from the Freedmen's Bureau was the only thing that former slaves ever got. They never got any payment or restitution for the hell they went through as a slave, all the money that was made off of their back. They got Nothing. So they were supposed to put that all back. 
Mm -hmm. What's that? So they're supposed to put it all behind you. Yeah, put it all behind you and move on. They got no money. They started with little league. Nothing. I mean, little. Nothing. And it's been like that to this day. And there was talk of giving them like 40 acres and a mule or something like that. That never, ever happened. It's actually incredibly remarkable. So, Southerners hated the Freedmen's Bureau as they saw you're making the former slaves more independent. And they always brought up thinking that went back to the positive good theory of slavery, that if you give them freedom, they'll either become criminals or they're, they don't know how to work. And they would say over and over again this term, lazy blacks, which I was going to say, you know, it's racist, but that's redundant saying it's racist because if it comes from the positive good theory of slavery, by definition, it's racist. And that adds to it, say you can't give them a job. Here are two ones that show up really well. The first one, the popular idea of the Freedmen's Bureau, plenty to eat and nothing to do, imply they're just allowing them to be lazy and sing songs. And then the one on the right, remember that term I told you before called Sambo? That shows a, a horrific caricature that a Sambo, lazing, doing nothing, while well, the white man works for them implying that, in fact, that was the goal of the North, to make the whites in the South slaves to the blacks. Now, by no means was that what was going on, but it was ways to discredit Reconstruction, implying it was never about giving rights. It's all about hurting and punishing the South. And the Northerners who went South, Southerners would give them a derogatory name called carpet baggage. And carpetbaggers, a lot of were people coming down with the Freedmen's Bureau to educate and help. There were a few, though, that were speculated. Northerners coming south. Now let's add something. Can you imagine land prices in the south? People didn't have any money. So the people did go down south thinking they could scoop up land for cheap. So there is, there's an element of truth, but then they said they're all carpetbaggers implying somebody from the North trying to exploit the South. This is a Northern politician, a Republican, Carl Schurz, and holding a carpet bag. By the way, a carpet bag, literally, that's what it is. Take a piece of carpet, pull it in half, sew the side, put a latch on it and a handle, and you got a cheap suitcase. This was from a textbook. That used to be a capital high until at least 79. <laughs> 1979. It was also a huge bit on the high. And then it came back to capital. This capital started in 74. And it says, Carpetbaggers, it's pitifully plain, use Southern defeat for personal gain. Two things. First, obviously, the carpet bag full of money stealing from the fallen South. So that's in the textbook. Secondly, and I've used this picture for a couple years. And it never dawned on me till first period today. Playing and game is a really bad poem. It never hit me till right today. How poetic, huh? That's a myth, but they use it well. And soon, those fighting Reconstruction in the South, they're all going to be Democrats. And they began to call any Southern Republicans, and a lot of Southern Republicans were black, scalawags. Which is a term of diver diversion. Here's implying that here's a carpetbagger forcing a white southerner to sign the shoes of now a freedman. Implying, well, I think you can get the implication. This one's amazing. There's a lot of these. Oh, I'll show that. After Reconstruction, there will only be the Democratic Party in the South. Don't think any ideology what they stand for. They're Democrats in the South because Lincoln was a Republican. Not including the new slave or the they're kicking out of power. By 1890, no former slaves could vote. So I know what you're saying, they'd be Republicans, but then they're just gonna be so but, but I like their ideals or ideologies kind of split. Republicans abandoned that too, and civil rights. The Republican Party would reemerge in the South in the early 1960s. Do you know why? as anti-civil rights. The Republican Party became the party against civil rights. A little bit ironic because the Republican Party was the party of civil rights. I mean, we have a, there's a continuum here. But here as the Democratic platform is 
platform is for the white man. The Republican platform is for the Negro and the carpetbagger. That's doesn't disguise much. So Scalawag and carpetbagger. So President Johnson, I think I don't need to tell you anything else about Johnson here, do I? Does that pretty much sum up his point of view? Doesn't care about him. Yeah, doesn't care at all. But there's one important thing. When Republicans would fight him, he would ally himself with the very aristocrats that he claimed to hate. Johnson would begin presidential reconstruction. Now, presidential reconstruction is put an arrow to the 10% plan because that's what it is. It's exactly the 10% plan except for one more thing. So you don't need to write it down again. Just put a little arrow. So it included, he said, I'm following Lincoln's idea. Loyal and amnesty. There's only two caveats you have to have. State constitutions had to ratify the 13th Amendment. So did that answer your question? Yeah. So they had to ratify the 13th Amendment. And they had to pay back their debts. They couldn't get away from debts before the war. The other thing is this. They, freedmen are promised rights. By the way, define a right to me. Trust me. The ability to do something. Yeah, something like not be a slave. The rest of it, nah. So basically, that's the only right they promised. You're not a slave anymore. You have no more rights. That sucks. And this is a pro Johnson cartoon. You ever seen those magicians where they have two hoops and they kind of put them together and pull them apart? And that's him like doing the magic trick of bringing the North and South together. He claimed he's following Lincoln's plan, but what happened is almost immediately in the South, all over the South, 10% of the population did the oath, and boom, the states right back in. By the end of the summer of 1865, all 11 states of the former Confederacy are right back into the Union. They call these governments Dixie Crap governments. You get it? Dixie and Crap and Democrat. The Democratic Party is going to be really weird in the 20th century. It'll be the party for civil rights and the party against civil rights in the same party. Weird time. But Dixiecrat governments, they were the old Confederates and the planters took power again. In fact, they started electing old members of Congress, former Confederate go government officials, back to the U.S. Congress. Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy from Georgia, was elected right back to his seat. And in the fall of 1865, went up to Washington, D.C., Expected to go right back to the House of Representatives like nothing ever happened. And then to control the freedmen, they passed laws called Black Codes. Uh, black Codes. You, what laws do you suppose they're exactly like? They just changed the name. <laughs> slave Codes. They're exactly the Slave Codes. No. Who was furious with this? When Republicans got back to Congress and went back in the session that fall, they were furious. Republicans were the party of the Emancipation Proclamation. And now Johnson did that. And he was elected with Lincoln. And they broke with him. And they broke with him in a couple ways. First off, Congress would not see those men like Jack uh, Stevens. The Republicans in Congress would not allow any members of Congress from the South. Next. They vetoed the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The Civil Rights Act was supposed to get rid of the black codes. Here, it also expanded the Freedmen's Bureau. Here's Johnson kicking over the rights of freedmen. You know, it's a Freedmen Bureau. Get it? Dresser. Clever, huh? But do you see the little figures jumping out? It was supposed to be the freedmen jumping out. It's kind of creepy and racist at the same time. Congress actually overrode that veto. The first time in history, two-thirds of Congress voted to override a veto. That just never happens. And Congress is furious. And now they're in open war with President Johnson. By the way, political cartoons, they always draw with big heads. Have you noticed that? Most people's heads aren't that big. Have you seen Bill Clinton? <laughs> Bill Clinton's got a big head. I'll tell you a story about that after the AP is done. 
But that's when Congress responded with congressional or radical. It's also called radical reconstruction with the 1867 Military Reconstruction Act. All right, Johnson. So this is radical reconstruction too, everyone got that? So if I have on the test tomorrow, radical reconstruction, we know it's congressional. Is everyone happy? <laughs> yes, I'm happy. And this is the military takeover of the South. They're gonna divide the South into five military districts. No southern state's going to be allowed back into the union until they ratify first two and then three amendments. They got to re ratify the 13th, the new 14th, which I'll get to in a second, and the 15th amendment. Big deal. And until that happens, until we can guarantee rights, the military will say the spectrum of the people in that society because the dolls will <laughs> represent them. Okay, this is a in the video on the history of toys for watching special topics. We're going through all the uh, really creepy dolls of the 19th century. Okay. They're creepy. But, so this is a big deal. The military is going to force it. So Ulysses S. Grant, until he's elected president in 1868, he's going to be in charge. And then after he becomes president, it's Sherman. By the way, they're also the same ones who would be responsible for clearing the plains of American Indians. And they learned how to fight the total war. So, with that, the Southern view, this is an invasion of the South. And soon, Southern mythology will say the reason the North started the Civil War in the first place, so they could invade us with reconstruction and make, make us the slaves of blacks. I can't even begin to tell you how ridiculous this is. But this is going to become, it's going to be called the lost cause myth. And it will prevail the South. We'll come back to it. So with that, here are the military districts and the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is the most important amendment to rectify the problems of the Black Codes and the Civil Rights Act to make sure it can't happen again. They thought civil rights for all citizens will be guaranteed. Has everyone got that? This is the most important amendment. Civil rights will be guaranteed, and the Bill of Rights goes to all the states. And I put there in small print, what it basically did is it made the Civil Rights Act of 66 the Constitution. It also guaranteed all citizens. By the way, the Bill of Rights never applied to the states until this. This is a really big deal. Next. Equal protection under the law for all citizens, regardless of where you live or race, color, or creed. You know, it's left a few out there, like sex. Everyone due process. And it defined what a citizen was for the most part. At least it made it clear that if someone's born in the U.S. like slaves, born in the U.S., they are citizens. And they also made it very clear it also applied to immigrants whether they're the immigrants coming from Europe, or at this time there was a big influx of immigrants from China. And so it said, if you're an immigrant here, and you have a child, that child is automatically a citizen. One more thing we have to add. Two more things, I'm sorry. Don't worry about the death thing. Put down women. Women aren't included. It said all citizens and all persons, all persons, all persons, but it defines person as a man. And that's still the law of the land today. Women are not guaranteed equal rights under the United States Constitution today. That's only about 54% of the population, so. It's remarkable. Now women, have mostly equal rights under the law, but laws can be changed. And I'll tell you more about that with equal rights amendment. We got one more thing with the bell ring. I know, don't get mad at me. The 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment, now I put it up here what it says in the law, but the bell's my right reason, let me say it. It says the rights of the citizens of the United States to vote should not be denied or abridged by any state. But do you notice the loophole? Why well, put question marks? The right of the, the vote, the right to vote cannot be abridged. 
but you have no right to vote. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that somebody has a right to vote. So I can't, if I was the government, I can't pass a law that says you can't vote. But I don't have to count them. I don't have to make it easy for you to vote. That's a big loophole. Now, some people were whining to me, and I'm not happy about it. So, yes! All around the limbo clock. Hey, let's do the limbo rock. Oh, don't move that limbo block. You'll be a limbo star. How low can you go? trying to decide I want to test on Friday or not. Okay, so. Raise your hand if you think that I'll count the votes. <laughs> Precisely. I'm leaning towards making it a take-home test. 
No. 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 so what do they do? They make them incredibly long and incredibly cumbersome. They make it so just like all of a sudden it's cold like right there. Yeah, that's science. I love it when it's really cold and have a wall of color. Last year when it was like one day it was like 25 below or something in the morning. I'll never get open that door and I'm literally like in a wall. But I love it. I'm not a tougher, hardier generation. I'm a wild city. The hottest place in the state and the third coldest place in the state. You could do What? Have I been here since yet? The bottom's bigger. Yeah. You got a wall of 100% humidity. Okay, so everybody, let's go ahead and take out the notes on toys. Let's have a vote. Do you want a test? Let's put it this way. Should I just do like a little quiz on Friday? Yes. Or a big test? No. Big, yes. test. big test. Big test? You guys should have spoke yes. up. Yeah, you're gonna have to know all of it. So Let's let's run take the dolls out. Remember the ride on dolls, and by the way, aren't the dolls the creepiest thing in the world? Yeah. Yes. I like this video. I think it does a good job. It kind of bounces around, but boy, aren't toys really important to get the little social the socialization of boys and girls? Where were you? Whoa! Somebody has some caffeine issues. Okay, so. All right, so. One more thing. So, tomorrow we are going to do the. Uh, we're going to do Vietnam War music, and that's when Mr. Chauncey will come. And maybe I will play with you, play you my uh, favorite Christmas song. My personal favorite. No, that's not a Christmas song. No. It's by the second grade band. You're right. My favorite. It's called. It's called Father Festivals. Okay, so. <laughs> oh, I, I